Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. I have the best job ever. (laughs) I love what I get to do in this world. And my work includes facilitating one-on-one angel sessions, which are wonderful, soul mentoring, which provides for consistent support as you move through a time of transformation and growth. And I also offer a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. And regarding my classes, there's always something new on the horizon. I ask the angels to help bring forward the inspiration of what I am to teach, and I listen. And I get so excited. I actually just had a download in the shower today of a new class I'm going to be offering in November. I'm not quite ready to share with you about it yet, but if you go over to my website, whether that class is available or another class, there's always something going. I really design my classes, so if you love taking classes with me, there's always something new that you can jump into. It's not as if you can only take one class and then we're done. I love the blessing of having relationship with my Illuminating Souls family. It's such a beautiful thing that we get to share this journey together. So my classes are almost always small in size. They're very intimate. So if you are looking for a loving, heart-centered community. If the idea of participating in a class where we can have conversation appeals to you, come on over to my website and we'll see what I've got going. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you rest and fall asleep unless you are someone who listens to the podcast during the day, in which case we are here to keep you company as you go about your day. I've heard from so many of you about how you use the podcast, and I know some of you use it for sleep. That was its original design. But I also know many of you listen during the day. So however you tune in, it is truly my honor to get to spend this time with you and bring you extra love and stories and goodness into your day or night. This is my 99th episode, which is crazy, which means the next one will be the 100th. So I've got some special stuff cooking up for you for the 100th episode. And I'm so excited to share this milestone with you. So stay tuned. But for now, the angels and I are going to bring to you loving, calming, soothing energy. So I invite you to take some nice deep breaths in and out. Just allowing the love of your angels and the love of the divine to flow to you now. There's been a lot of energy swirling about. 
You know, I have had probably the busiest 10 days that I have had in a really long time. I feel like I have just been busy and gone from event to event, task to task, experience to experience. And so I have to say, I really appreciate this opportunity to come into the blanket fort and just breathe in some love with you. It feels like my nervous system could use it. It's not that anything is bad or off kilter. It just feels that I haven't had enough opportunity to spend time in this space and that I get to spend this time with you. It makes it even better. You know, that adage that says wherever two or more are gathered in God's name, miracles happen. That's what this podcast is. That it doesn't matter that we're not listening to the broadcast at the same time because there is no time or space when it comes to divine love but that there are dozens of us listening to this message coming together in sacred circle amplifies the energy field and makes it easier for each one of us to connect. So again, let's just take some nice deep breaths in and just releasing whatever you have to release. You know, those really great exhales where you just say, all right, God, I'm going to let it all go. (laughs) Just take one of those breaths and let whatever your it is, let it go now. And allow your body to relax, your beautiful, precious body. Allow it to receive the waves of relaxation that are flowing through now. And if you are preparing for bed, I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in and get comfortable in your bed or wherever it is you are sleeping. I love burrowing under the covers. It's getting cooler here now and I sleep so much better in a cool room. So I love getting into bed on a chilly night and pulling up all the covers. (laughs) And I don't know, something about it makes me feel safe. It's not that I feel unsafe, but there's something very comforting about climbing into bed on a chilly night with all the pillows plumped up just so. And so I invite you to get comfortable in whatever way works best for you. And while you do, I'm going to call in the angels, even though they're already here. I love getting to call them in with you. So I invite you to just take another nice deep breath in as we call ourselves forward into the heart of God and beautiful angels on high. I ask that you join us here, and I know you are already here, and I am grateful for your invitation to invite us into this beautiful, light-filled sanctuary. And angels, I ask that you continue bringing forward gentle waves of love for each of our beloveds listening to this message. Angels, I ask that you clear our energy fields through the light of God, clearing away anything that is not ours, anything that no longer serves us, and infusing our energy fields with beautiful source energy that we may be replenished. 
that we may be imbued with inspiration and hopefulness for brighter tomorrows. And angels, I ask that you help each one of us in our own unique way awaken even more fully to our beautiful, divine, authentic self. Please pave our way with grace and blessings and joy. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and I affirm that wonderful things are blossoming open for you. You know, sometimes on the journey of self-growth, when we talk about things like law of attraction, often we're told to visualize what we want, visualize it, think of it. And you know, I think that works sometimes if you have a really clear vision of what it is you want. I will tell you that does not often work for me anymore because I don't necessarily know what it is I want. I don't mean that to sound passive or uninspired. Rather, each day to me feels like a blessing and my life feels like it is a continuum of loving light goodness. <laughs> and I love the invitation to open to God's dreams for me, because I believe God can dream a brighter dream for me than I can. That's a Maya Angelou-ism in a way. And that's part of what we're going to talk about in tonight's story time, but we're not quite there yet. But I'll say it this way. Give yourself permission to open to the divine streams for you. Allow that to feel really expansive. Because your soul it is ever evolving. Each of us, we learn and we grow and we evolve every single day. And there might be dreams incubating within you that you did not even know about six months ago. I love living my life with the concept that not all the bold strokes of who I am have yet to be revealed. That maybe there are still super cool things to learn about myself. And if this is true for me, this is true for you. For instance, what if you're an amazing writer, but you haven't yet started writing? What if you can paint and you didn't know it? What if you find that you love something creative or daring that you haven't yet experienced? What if something you used to love flows back to you now? I had that experience over the pandemic. I found my way back to crocheting. My mom had taught me to crochet when I was eight years old, and it had kept me company throughout my life, but I hadn't done anything with it f for years. And that's a whole story time for another day, but I found my way back to crocheting in such a beautiful way for the past few years. So there are aspects of you, beautiful, wondrous expressions of you that come calling every once in a while. Maybe you have your old journals in a box in the garage, or you have something under your bed. Maybe you tucked away some old painting supplies. 
or your scrapbooking or something. Just pay attention to what feels like it is inspiring you. Allow the beauty of your soul to blossom open and delight you as who you are right now because you are a miracle from on high. You are a beautiful, divine, wise being having your very human experience and you are a gift in this world. I promise you, you are. So just take a few nice deep breaths in, just allowing your body to continue to relax. Listening to the sound of my voice as I keep you company as you drift off. It is such a blessing to be here with you now. I have such love in my heart for you. Even if we've never met, I feel you in this beautiful sanctuary we are in and not in some creepy way. So don't think that I, (laughs) it's a non-intrusive knowing of you, I promise. But I just feel the love of your heart. And I am so deeply grateful for this opportunity to shine this love with you. You are one of the ways that God's love is made visible on this planet. That is something that they always say at Agape. And I feel the energy flowing. I feel it rising up within and around me. And that's always a clairsentient awareness of the energy that's flowing. Clairsentience is a way of feeling energy, sensing energy. And I can feel it and I promise you it is flowing to you now. And you don't need to do anything right now. Just receive this love. And listen, if you're not feeling it or sensing it, do not worry. Right? Even if you're in a house with no windows, the sun is still shining outside. It's still there. You know it's there. So it is with divine love. It is here for you. And it is helping you. It is supporting you. Even if you can't feel it or sense it or know how it's working with you, it is here in service to your highest and best good. So if you have any prayers in your heart that you want to bring forward for the angels and for God, just bring them forward in the the quiet sacredness of your consciousness and share your prayers, your intentions, whatever you want with God and the angels and they will receive and they will amplify what is in your heart. A prayer shared is a prayer multiplied. So we multiply your prayers in this moment. Just imagine beautiful angels gathering around, amplifying your prayers. Isn't that a lovely visualization? Let's all come into that now. And so thank you for sharing in our prayer circle here. As we ripple goodness and light to each of our beloveds here, and then we ripple it to all of those that you love, and then we ripple it to all that love you, and then we ripple it all around this world. You know, we have listeners from all around the world. So our prayer circle goes far and wide. So take another breath in, allowing the love to flow to you now. And allow yourself to rest. And while you rest, the angels will be with you. And I'm going to tell you some stories. 
So in this episode, I want to share with you about this wondrous adventure that I'm having as I collect these community cookbooks. So let me start off by sharing with you what a community cookbook is. I didn't even know that was a term. But community cookbooks were put together by groups of usually women, although I would say as we came into the later decades, men participated in these as well. But if you think about church groups, temple sisterhoods, PTAs, and other organizations, the women would get together and they would submit their recipes to these cookbooks. And then someone would typeset them. They usually were spiral bound. And then they would be sold as a fundraiser. I first came across a community cookbook as a wondrous thing earlier this year for the podcast. I don't even know how I fell down this rabbit hole, which to me is one of the coolest things about co-creating with the angels. I can't even tell you with certainty about how I found my way to them. But I believe I must have been searching for antiquarian cookbooks on eBay, thinking those would be fun to share in a podcast episode. And I came across one of these community cookbooks from a temple in Chicago where I was raised, not at this specific temple. But I thought, well, that looks kind of cool. And whoever was selling it had posted some pictures of the interior pages, and there were kugel recipes. And I love kugel, <laughs> which is a Jewish casserole. So I paid, I bought it, I paid for it, they shipped it to me. And when I opened the cover, It had belonged to a woman because she had written her name and address who lived maybe two miles away from where I grew up. So to me, that was utterly enchanting. And I shared some recipes that I think was one of the first recipe episodes I shared with you on the podcast. And then I was hooked because I I don't know how you are, but I become a bit obsessed when I find something I love. And this can work in my favor and it can work to my detriment. But I think in this case, it really worked in my favor. I started looking on eBay for other Jewish sisterhood recipes, because that's the keywords I was using. And I found more and I bought more. And What is so remarkable about these community cookbooks is they are really reflections of how the women cooked back then. You know, the cookbooks you buy off of Amazon or in a bookstore are wonderful, but typically they are tried and true recipes. They have been tested in test kitchens. They have been refined to reflect a certain palate or cuisine. And for me, as someone who doesn't really enjoy cooking, I love eating, but not cooking. Those kinds of cookbooks make it seem really hard. And and I'm not going to go through a recipe that has 20 ingredients and 20 steps. I'm just not interested. But a lot of these recipes in these community cookbooks are simple and they use the ingredients of the time. And some of them include packaged goods ingredients. I shared with you in a recent podcast about some of the dietetic recipes that are in some of these cookbooks. 
And I find that I'm falling in love with these women. You know, some of the community cookbooks, the women are listed by their husband's name, right? I would be Mrs. Wes Maffei. <laughs> and it really speaks to the era. So I've started collecting them. And I shared with you a few episodes ago that my husband and I traveled to Park City, Utah. He had a business meeting. And Friday afternoon that we were there, we had some extra time. And and some people would go hiking. They might do something very adventurous based in the beautiful space we were in. My husband and I went and looked for rare and used bookstores. That's our happy place. So we went to this really awesome rare and used bookstore. And my husband was looking for the stuff he loves. And I went to look at the cookbooks to see if they had any of these community cookbooks. And they did. So the one that I found is Favorite Recipes of Indiana P.E.O.'s. Now, I had never heard of a P.E.O. It's P like Paul, E like elephant, O. I never heard of a PEO group before, but I had seen them listed on many community cookbooks. So it's a really cool organization. Let me share with you a little bit about what the PEO community does. This is off their website. PEO was founded on January 21st, 1869 by seven students at Iowa Wesleyan College in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. This circle of kindred spirits, bonded by their enthusiasm for women's opportunities, eventually expanded to include women off campus as well. Through membership, the PEO Sisterhood has brought together more than half a million women in the United States and Canada who are passionate about helping women advance through education while supporting and motivating them. Friendship is the cornerstone of PEO. It is the legacy left by our founders, and it thrives in our unique sisterhood, PEO exists to be a source of encouragement and support for women to realize their potential in whatever worthwhile endeavor they choose. True to the mission of promoting educational opportunities for women, education continues to be the primary philanthropy of the PEO sisterhood. Isn't that wonderful? I had never heard of them before, so... If any of you have been involved with PEO or have any stories about it, I'd love to hear from you. It seems like a really worthwhile organization. So this cookbook starts off um, with a greeting. This is um, from the president of the Indiana State Chapter. It says, we are pleased to offer this cookbook as an aid to your continued success in the culinary arts. And it says, with all good wishes, Vivian Morrison, president of Indiana State Chapter, PEO Sisterhood, 1958 to 1959. Now I have to tell you about the recipe that utterly delighted me when I was flipping through the pages of this cookbook. It's a recipe that if you grew up in the United States is going to be familiar to you. And you either love it or you hate it. (laughs) I don't mean to make it sound so passionate, but it's a very commonplace recipe that I often associate with Thanksgiving. And it is the green bean casserole. 
For those of you outside of the U.S., I I don't know that the green bean casserole has made it far beyond our borders. But typically, it's green beans. Um, Many people use canned. My mom used to use the frozen French cut green beans. A can of Campbell's mushroom soup, which is condensed and you keep it that way. You can put in some water chestnuts for some crunch. And then on top go the the fried onions that come in the can. Now, this has been a much maligned dish, right? Many people say terrible things about it, but I think for a lot of us, we grew up with this as a comfort food. I still love a good green bean casserole. I don't make it very often, but I enjoy it when it's presented. But here's here's why I'm so fascinated that this is in a cookbook from 1959. So think about life back then. You didn't have the internet, for sure. There were cookbooks but you'd sort of flip through cookbooks looking for your recipes. There, there might be recipes in your local paper. Another way recipes were traded is a friend wrote it down on a slip of paper and then you made it. And I'm not sure how popular the green bean casserole was back then so that it shows up in one of these recipe books. I just think is so interesting So it's listed as green beans for the church supper. Three cans of green beans, French or cut. And just so you know what French green beans are, they're sliced long ways, so they're thin. Um, So it's not the whole green bean. They sort of slice it. They julienne it, I guess you could say. So three cans of green beans, one can of cream of mushroom soup condensed, and one can of French fried onion rings. Method. Place drained beans in a baking dish. Spread mushroom soup over them. Crumble over the top French fried onion rings. Bake in a 350 degree oven for 20 minutes. If you wish to make this full of surprise, add a can of water chestnuts sliced thin to the beans before covering with soup. Also add a few toasted almonds sliced on top of the onion rings or use celery soup as substitute for mushroom soup. And this was provided by Virginia Snap in Chapter Y. So I, I just am delighted that green bean casserole is in this book from 1959. I don't know why, I just think This was probably a recipe women found easy to make. The ingredients were easy to find, probably inexpensive at the market, right? You open a few cans, you pour it into a dish, and ta-da, you have a side dish for dinner. See, to me, this kind of cooking is much more relatable than going through a famous chef's cookbook. This, like this, I would make green bean casserole. This is right in my wheelhouse. Open some cans, pour them into a dish, cook them. (laughs) I know it's making you all want to come over to my house for dinner, right? (laughs) Okay. We'll find some more from this cookbook. And then we have a tuna noodle casserole. So again, I think many of us grew up with tuna noodle casseroles. This is called an albacore noodle casserole. So you take one three ounce can of fried noodles. I'm not sure what those are. Um, I wonder if those are like the wonton noodles or something. Um, One can of mushroom soup a half a cup of milk, I'm sure that was whole milk, 
a quarter cup of chopped onion, one cup of finely chopped celery, one can of white albacore tuna. It doesn't tell us how many ounces, but I'm sure it's a good sized can and a quarter pound of cashew nuts. Put half of the fried noodles in a buttered casserole. Put mixture of other ingredients on top. Cover with the remainder of fried noodles. Bake half an hour in a 350 degree oven. Serves four or six. And this is from Margaret Kessling, Chapter AR. I will say, serving six people on this particular meal, they are eating very small portions. See, I relate to these recipes. Here's another one for a vegetable casserole, one package of frozen cauliflower, one package of frozen peas and carrots, cook until tender, add a cup of celery, which has been softened in one tablespoon of butter, make rich, sharp cheddar cheese sauce. And I love that they don't even tell us how to make the sauce. They're just assuming we know because we are making three meals a day for our families as women and mix together in bacon casserole. Sprinkle chopped parsley on top for color. And this is from Rose Long of Chapter B. See, that would be the way I would cook. A couple packages of frozen veg, some sort of cheddar cheese concoction. (laughs) Like... I need this to be super easy. Okay, let's see what else I can find. And I went ahead and skipped over to desserts because, of course, they're going to have amazing desserts in here, right? Butterscotch brownies. Who does not love a good butterscotch brownie? So we take a quarter cup of butter, one cup of brown sugar packed, one egg, one cup of sifted flour, one teaspoon baking powder, half a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of vanilla, and two-thirds cup of chopped nuts. So you cream the butter and the sugar, beat the egg, and add sift flour, baking powder, and salt. Add to batter. Add vanilla and chopped nuts. Spread the batter in eight or nine-inch square greased pan. Bake at 325 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes. And this is from Sally Todd, Chapter BH. And since it is the fall, what if I share with you frozen pumpkin pie? So one and a half cups of cooked pumpkin, one teaspoon of cinnamon, one teaspoon of ginger, one eighth teaspoon of salt, so just a pinch of salt, one cup of powdered sugar, three egg yolks well beaten, three egg whites beaten stiff, and one cup of cream whipped. So to the pumpkin add spices, sugar, salt, and egg yolks. Cook in a double broiler until it thickens, stirring constantly. Let cool slowly Then add in the stiffly beaten egg whites, two-thirds of a cup of whipped cream, removing remainder one-third for topping. Place in freezer tray until chilled and partially frozen. When ready to serve, pack filling into previously baked pie shell and top with whipped cream. That sounds yummy. Oh, that is from Bess R. Cunningham of Chapter K, PSP, and also from M. May Hadley, Chapter AV. There is a recipe here for, for a generic form of Chex Mix, and who does not like a, a good Chex Mix? It's like every bite is a surprise. So this is called Snack Mix. So one box of bite-sized shredded wheat, one box ready-to-eat oat cereal, and then it says as parens little donuts, which we would know as Cheerios, two boxes of small stick pretzels broken, 
two boxes of bite-sized shredded rice, one pound of mixed salted nuts, and then for the the topping they're using, well, they're using some bacon fat. Okay, I'm going to leave that out though, because that doesn't sound good to me. One cup of margarine, I would use butter, one teaspoon celery salt, one teaspoon of savory salt, which might be like Lowry's, two taste tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, two dashes of Tabasco sauce, so they're going to go a little spicy here, and one teaspoon garlic salt. So you mix cereal and nuts in a large pan, heat fats until melted and seasoned, and pour over cereals and toss, and then you put into a 250 degree oven and bake 45 to 60 minutes stirring every 10 minutes. This makes a large amount and can be stored in a tight fitting container. And this is from Hazel Lybrook, chapter BS. And you know what? I will just a little commentary here. I love homemade Chex Mix so much more than the packaged Chex Mix in the store. The stuff in the store is way too salty for me. So I I don't make it anymore because I would just eat the entire batch myself. But if I ever have a reason to have people over and I can make it for people so that I'm not the one consuming 20 servings of Chex Mix myself, I will make it. So perhaps I will make it for Thanksgiving and then I get to have some. Okay, and then this is my kind of recipe. Apple crisp. Six to eight apples peeled and quartered, one cup of brown sugar, one cup sifted pastry flour, half a cup of butter. Place apples in casserole, work sugar, flour, and butter together until crumbly. Then pack it closely over apples, bake at 350 degrees for one and a half hours. So here's what I love about this recipe. It's easy. I don't have to keep turning back to the recipe book trying to figure out what's my 11th step in making this thing. I just want to chop up some apples and make some crumble and mix it all together, which is basically how I make my apple crisp for my husband. I chop up the apples. I usually will put in some frozen blueberries because it makes it really yummy. I try not to sweeten it with too much. I mean, it does need sweetener. So sometimes I'll put in sugar. Sometimes I'll use agave. It depends on what I have. I'll put in some kind of thickener, whether it's flour or cornstarch. And then usually I'll just bake the apples on their own for a while until they get kind of tender. And then I put the crumble mixture on top. And it's super yummy. There's something here called hash. I've never had this before. So a half a pound of vanilla wafers, which they say is one seven ounce box, half a cup of soft butter, one cup of powdered sugar, and two raw eggs. So cream butter and mixture, and then add the sugar slowly. Add one egg at a time. Beat and beat until like whipped cream. Roll vanilla wafers fine. Put half of the crumbs in a buttered dish. Spread on butter mixture. And then you add half a pint of whipping cream whipped. Half a cup of chopped pecans. A small bottle of cherries chopped fine. And then mix and spread on butter mixture. Cover with the other half of the crumbs. Refrigerate 48 hours and serves 12. Yeah, no way does this serve 12 people. Not with our big American 2022 appetites. This is contributed by chapter A1. How many people do you think this would serve? You have one box of vanilla wafers, one cup of powdered sugar, and two eggs. There's no way. 
This serves 12 people. This serves maybe six. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's just, that's just me. I like a substantial portion of something if I'm going to have it. Well, not really. I can't really eat like that anymore. Well, I wouldn't have this now anyways, because I don't eat sugar. But if I did eat sugar and I went to the trouble of making this dessert, I would have had a big piece of it back in the day. I'm just saying. And then there are three different crumb cake recipes. I love a good crumb cake. So we'll pick this one. Two cups of sifted flour, two cups of brown sugar, half a cup of butter melted or margarine, one egg, one cup of sour milk, one teaspoon of soda added to milk, nuts if desired, I always would desire those, and one teaspoon of vanilla. Pour melted butter over sugar and flour, working thoroughly with fingers, set aside three quarters cups of crumbs, add eggs and milk with soda, add vanilla, pour into greased six by 10 pan, sprinkle with crumbs, Bake at 325 degrees for 45 to 50 minutes and will serve eight. Helen Blue Chapter Z. I, I guess serving eight is reasonable if it's a loaf pan. It's just a it's just a little smidge, right? But then you know, I don't know how it works for you if you have a loaf pan of something that you always have to even the edge so you take a little bit more right? You kind of go by the kitchen. I'll speak for myself. Maybe you don't do anything so barbaric. I would go by the kitchen and lift up the foil or the saran and I would just take a little tiny sliver, so small no one would even notice it was gone, and help myself to just the little sliver of a crumb. But I would do that, you know, like three times in an hour, which would be a whole piece. But I don't know if you've ever read the research on this, but if you just eat things, little slivers at a time, there are no calories in it. It doesn't count. <laughs> and you know I'm joking, right? Because I don't want you to think that I'm right about something that important. But you know, like when there's the tray of brownies or something and you just take that little corner Little corners of things do not count. It's like the samples at Costco do not count. Small little bites of things are free. (laughs) So that would have been me with this crumb cake for sure. Oh, look, those crumbs fell off. Well, I should just eat those. They don't count, even though they are the very best part of the cake. Okay, so this next recipe is totally up my alley. It's called a filled angel food cake. And here's why it's up my alley. Just bear with me for a minute. We start off with placing a 10 inch angel food cake upside down on a plate. There is no recipe for this angel food cake. So I'm assuming that part of the recipe is to go to the supermarket or the bakery and buy one. I am on board with this. Maybe it's an Entenmann's angel food cake. Maybe I've gone to the local bakery and purchased one. Somebody else has prepared this cake right up my alley. Because now I can zhuzh it up, right? We're going to zhuzh up our store-bought angel food cake. So you slice the entire top from the cake about one inch down. You lift off the top and you lay it to one side. I can do that. Cut down into one inch from the outer edge and one inch from the center hole, leaving a substantial wall of cake about one inch thick and a one inch base on the bottom. So it sounds like we are trenching the cake similar to those people who hollow out a bagel, which I don't, I don't do. If you're going to have a bagel, have the whole bagel. But there are people who take the stuffing out of the bagel and they just eat the crust. But so we're trenching a store-bought angel food cake. 
Again, I can do that. Remove the center with a curved knife or a spoon, being careful to leave a wall of cake at the bottom one inch thick. Place this on a serving plate. Completely fill the cavity with the chilled filling, which we will talk about in a moment. Replace the top of cake and press gently. Cover top and sides with remaining chilled cream. Okay, this is a phenomenal recipe for many reasons. First, we have the store-bought angel food cake. This fits for me. We're trenching the cake, so I'm feeling like something about it will be homemade. Here's our here's our filling. This is a cocoa fluff filling. Try to say that 10 times fast. Cocoa fluff filling. We take three cups of chilled whipping cream, which I'm assuming we have whipped. And really, in my case, would probably be Cool Whip. One and a half cups of sifted confectioner's sugar, which if I'm doing the whole Cool Whip routine, I do not even need the sugar a three quarter cup of cocoa and a quarter teaspoon of salt. And you mix it into a chilled bowl and then beat until stiff. Okay. So I would do the cool whip. I wouldn't need extra sugar. Cocoa sounds good to me. Salt I would have. Okay. And so I'd mix that together and I would fill in my trench and my store-bought angel food cake And then I would replace the top and put the rest of the fluff on top. Now, I I have to ask you, how do you know you are a true foodie? Because how many of you are giving thought to what is happening to the parts of the angel food cake that were removed from our trench? Like they're are bits of angel food cake right now sitting in a bowl or on a plate right now that are unused. Isn't that brilliant? Because you can nosh on those before your company comes over. Like you've got this bowl of cake remnants. I mean, would you throw them out? I don't think so. They would get noshed on. You'd be like, listen, I, this isn't good enough to serve to company, but I can eat them. <laughs> I have the remnants of my angel food trench here. I'm going to put them in a little baggie and I will nosh on them to my heart's content. And this, my friends, is why I have oh, I had food issues my whole life because I think of things like that. Right? I lick the spoon when I'm making a cake, not only do I lick the spoon, I lick the dish, the bowl. That's the best part. (laughs) A stale cake can be, you know, softened up in the microwave. It is a really good thing I don't eat sugar anymore because I am a crazy person when it comes to sugar. I'm just saying there's so much that is good about this recipe because it's not even really a recipe. We're zhuzhing up a store-bought cake, and then there's leftover crumbs. It's brilliant. Okay, there's a recipe here that I am not going to share with you, but it involves sausage. So it's a whole cake recipe and sausage, (laughs) which I do not understand. My brain is very confused about this. Um, There is a tomato soup spice cake, which I have heard of before, but I have never made. There's a wonderful woman on TikTok. I forget what her username is, but she calls herself the leader of the Fat Kid Alliance, and she's always making recipes like this. She makes different kinds of pound cake and butter cake, and her thing is you have to remember to use a spatula to scrape out the bowl. (laughs) I love her, but I think she may have made a tomato soup spice cake before. I'll share it with you since we're talking about it. It doesn't sound appealing to me, but maybe you grew up with something like this. You take half a cup of butter, one cup of sugar, one can of tomato soup, one teaspoon soda, two cups of flour, 
two table that's oh it's two teaspoons be careful two teaspoons of baking powder one teaspoon nutmeg one teaspoon cinnamon one teaspoon cloves a quarter teaspoon of salt one cup of raisins and half a cup of chopped nuts so you melt butter add sugar soup and soda sift dry ingredients together and add to first mixture add raisins and nuts and pour batter into greased and floured tube pan. Bake at 350 degrees for 40 minutes. Oh, and then there's frosting involved. Now I'm interested. One package of Philadelphia cream cheese, half a cup of powdered sugar, and one teaspoon of vanilla. And this is from Mary Lib Walker in Chapter AI. And we will end with this one, dream bars. These are going to sound very familiar to you because I think so many of us grew up with them. One can of Borden's condensed milk. Do you know where we're going yet? I'll give you the next one. 21 graham crackers rolled. One package of coconut. And one package of chocolate chips. Stir together and bake in greased pan for 20 minutes, 325 degrees, let cool a little bit, and cut. Selma Campbell, Chapter AJ. For dreamy goodness. Right? I think so many of us grew up. This may have been one of the first things we were allowed to cook by ourselves because we just had to mix it all together. I think we also called these seven layer bars because they also included butterscotch chips and nuts. I don't know. All I remember is they were absolutely delish. So a big thank you for the women at the Indiana PEO of 1958 to 1959. I am grateful that you put this recipe book together. And isn't it fascinating that I found it in a bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah in the year 2022? I just think that is a magical, marvelous thing. And then I get to share these recipes with you. And it is such a blessing. My heart is so happy. See, I didn't even know I would fall in love with these kinds of recipe books. I didn't know. It wasn't on my radar. But that one book showed up in my life, and I shared it with you. And now I collect them. And I feel like it's important to collect them because it pays tribute to all of these women. And it helps us remember how they used to cook and take care of their families and what life was like back then. I don't know. It makes me so happy. My husband and I, oh, I have so many stories to tell you about this. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. But my husband and I were talking yesterday about how I might at some point put together a website where I share each one of these books a little bit because they should be out there. You know, I think about these women's families, right? Maybe their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren might not even know that these books exist and how cool it would be to pay tribute to them. So I don't know. I don't know what I'll do with this, but it feels really special and it inspires my heart, and it makes me happy. And I'm so happy to share it with you. So thank you for letting me share this joy with you. I'm so deeply grateful for you. I'm so grateful that we get to spend time together in the blanket fort with the angels. And I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you miracles and blessings and magic. And I look forward to connecting again soon. So I love you very much. And I'm deeply grateful for you. Thank you.